Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Strange Pathways. I'm your host, Scott Mort. I hope you are having a wonderful, wonderful week. Put in a lot of hard physical labor this week. Uh, pouring, pouring the concrete shell of a pool. I am very tired. My muscles are very sore. In fact, whenever I got home Friday, I just walked into my shower, clothes and all, peeled off my clothes and was surprised to find that my shirt had been cemented to my skin. It's uh, I got a couple quite painful welts where the skin peeled off uh, just from contact with the cement. Uh, So really, really tired this week. Bear with me as we make it through. And thank you so much for being here. Now, our first tale. I got this story from Lon Strickler's phantomsandmonsters.com. Amazing website. It's one of the few websites that I, I tend to go to every single day. An anonymous witness wrote in to Lon and said that years ago, the witness and his wife went to a conference, a UFO conference, and they ended up talking to a well-known UFO researcher. He's, he's a physicist. He doesn't give the guy's identity. He just gives the initials GW. I, I don't know who GW is. I didn't really do a lot of digging. If any of you people have any idea of who GW be, uh, might be, yeah, let me know. I'm curious as to who people think that this might be. Leave it leave it in the comments down below on YouTube. So GW was attending a discussion about UFOs. He's in this building. There are rows and rows of chairs. The chairs are close. They're really tightly packed. I, I have, I'm picturing like a small room like in a, a Ramada Inn or a Holiday Inn. And the, those chairs, they're folding chairs. And they're just tightly packed, semicircle. That's what I'm picturing myself. Now, GW is not the presenter. He's in the audience listening to the presentation. And he notices this family sitting right in front of him. It's a family of three, a father, a mother, and a child. The presenter is discussing the theoreticals of UFO propulsion. I've, I've heard many, many theoreticals. The, the gravity distortion for element 115, the, the quantum, quantum entanglement theory, the multidimensional theory that these are not... Not alien craft, but multidimensional. There are, there's theory upon theory upon theory of how these crafts travel the way that they do. But this presenter is, is theorizing how these UFOs, while in atmosphere, they may be using a ramjet to assist them during their flight. It's at this point that GW notices the child lean over to his mother and the child goes, but that's how our ship runs. And the mother goes, shh, very sternly. But GW had heard this. GW is certain 100% certain that he heard this child say, but that's how our ship runs. The presentation's over. Everyone starts to leave. GW finds the woman and says, I kind of, I kind of heard what, what your your child said can you can you tell me any more and the woman surprisingly very friendly very friendly says yeah we're we're not native to earth gw i, I mean 
who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be, right? I would be I would be fairly excited. I would be I would be on the edge of my on the edge of my sanity, much less my seat. This is the opportunity we all wait for. The lady, though, does not want to go into detail. He asked her, though, please, please show me some evidence. Show me the truth. The woman, very slowly, lowered what GW calls a cloaking device to show GW her real form. A praying mantis insectoid alien. Now, only GW saw it. No one else saw this. The woman... The woman's kind of amused. GW didn't really react. The woman's woman's kind of tickled about this. Which says a lot to me. Maybe the reason they don't want us here is because they're afraid that we're going to be scared of them. And I guarantee there would be some of us who are. But imagine that, being being afraid to show your true form. Something as alien as a praying mantis-type form. And you show it to a human. And they're just like, that's cool. I do have this dream that one day... One day, like, we'll be able to be walking down the street and go, you see see that person walking down the street there? They weren't born on this planet. They didn't evolve from apes like we did. They evolved from from mantis-like insects. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, right? I'm hopeful that that these beings are kind and benevolent and want what's good for us. And I hope that we would be, I hope that we would be kind in them in return. I doubt it. I really doubt humans. If we found, if we sent found a similar species to us, technologically, morally, I doubt we'd be kind. Look at what we do to dolphins. Dolphins are so amazingly intelligent. I mean, really, in in my opinion, in my opinion, the only reason why dolphins haven't evolved past us is the fact that they live in the ocean, which does not give them access to things like fire, and they have no thumbs. Once dolphins start evolving thumbs and using fire, humanity should probably look out they'd probably treat this world a lot better than us too. You want some proof? Go go look up what a dolphin's brain looks like next to a human's and tell me it is not a more sophisticated computer. You can't. You can tell just by looking at it. They're they're running they're running a Lenovo Legion and we're running on an Apple 2e. But GW has more questions for this very friendly praying mantis alien lady. She declined to answer and they left. I am super, super curious to who GW was. I'm sure that if I did a little bit more digging, as I said at the top of the show, it was a very busy week, but I'm sure that if I did a little more digging, I could figure out who GW was. And I guarantee as soon as somebody comes up and goes, GW is blah, blah, blah. It's going to go. Of course, of course it was. I can't wait for a follow up on this. This excites me. This excites me. So many, so many UFO encounters, so many alien encounters, so many ghost encounters, cryptic encounters are terrifying and horrible and malevolent. It, 
it does my soul good to see a friendly one, a benevolent encounter. I could stand more of these. Our second tale is going to take us all the way back to October 1972, Eastbourne, Sussex, England. Now, the author of the book, The Truth Behind Men in Black, Jenny Randalls, she calls this gentleman Billy Doyle. Billy Doyle is employed at a seaside hotel. It's, it's his job to make tea and coffee for, for the guests. And, and really, he, he loves it. He loves the sea. And he loves taking walks by the sea. One of his favorites, he did it almost every night, was to walk over the golf links towards uh, Beachy Head, which is a beautiful sheer cliff. Uh, sadly, this is also known as the suicide capital of England. But it, it's gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. Billy sets off about 7.30 p.m., he walks for about 90 minutes, and now it's, it's pitch dark. He decides he's going to make his way back to the hotel. He's going to take a shortcut. He's going to duck under a wire fence protecting the golf course. He does this, and something odd happens. This thick cloud, this rolling mist, comes in from the sea, and just covers the entire area. Visibility was only a few feet. Now these fields, these fields in the golf course, it's unlit. Everything is, is black. It was already dark, but now it is black. It's still and silent. Now remember, there are cliff tops nearby. And Billy knows that there are cliff tops nearby. So he stops and he, he's kind of planning his next move. All of a sudden, this huge star appears from the mist above. He's, he's thinking it's a search and rescue helicopter, but the glow approaches and settles on the ground ahead of him. It's, it's got this strange violet blue glow to it. It's beautiful. This was, this was not a helicopter. This was a solid object. It's, it's just like this huge conglomeration of lights of the most beautiful colors. They move about, the, especially the green and the reds of the lights. Now, Billy can't really see the exact shapes. The, the glow is so intense that he can't make out what the actual shape of whatever this is, is. But then he starts to notice something new. His skin is tingling. His hair is standing on end. And then, and then a voice fills Billy Doyle's head. It speaks in English, clear, precise, not a trace of Irish in it. It says... Don't be afraid. And it keeps repeating over and over. It becomes a mantra. Don't be afraid. Billy feels lured towards the object. He walks towards it. He keeps repeating himself. It's all right. I'm safe. Everything changes then. He has no memory uh, of how it changes, but everything changes instantly. Billy was walking across the grass towards the lights, and in the blink of an eye, it's gone. And now he's not even on top of grass. There's a hard, solid surface beneath his feet. Does a quick look around. Somehow now... He's on the road. Everything's clear. The mist is gone. It's 1.30 
a.m. Billy Doyle was still in the mindset that it was around 9 p.m. There's around four, four and a half hours missing here. Billy quickly steps off the highway onto the pavement. He, he thinks to himself, not even a lunatic walks in the center of the road like I was doing. I, I don't know how I got here. About 10 minutes later, Billy gets his bearings. He realizes he was on a street about three quarters of a mile away from the golf course, and he doesn't understand how he got so far. In fact, Billy doesn't realize that he's, he's lost all this time until he gets back to the hotel that he's working at. And he sees, he sees that it's 1.30 in the morning. The porter goes, Billy, are you okay? And Billy just goes, I, I saw a star. And the porter kind of makes a joke. He goes, right, were there camels too? Billy decides the best thing he can do is get a good night's sleep. He does that. And in the morning, he goes over to the police station and says, have you got one of those things that can tell whether you're lying? Now, this desk sergeant looks up, asks Billy, what do you mean? He goes, I, I saw a UFO. And the cop just waves him off and he goes, go see a doctor or a psychiatrist. We've, we've got better things to do here. It's at this point that Billy gives up and he decides no one's going to believe him. About two weeks pass and a man enters the hotel. He flashes a card to the reception desk says he was with the police and says, I want to speak to Billy Doyle. They get Billy. And Billy says that the man claims to be some sort of special officer with the CID. He's there to investigate Billy's UFO sighting. Billy and this man dressed in black... They go to an empty room. He tells them, I want to hear everything. Tell me the story. Billy finishes his story. And the stranger says, what would you say if I asked you not to report this? That it's a government matter. Billy says he would agree not to say anything. The man nods. He's kind of satisfied with Billy's answer. He reasoned with Billy, going, you do realize that nobody will ever believe your story. I suggest you keep it to yourself. Now, Billy kind of comes out of a haze. He, he realizes, I haven't really paid too much attention to this, to this man. He did say that, that he was dressed in a very smart suit, looked impressive. But the man would kind of jump around any question of his origin. He wouldn't really say where exactly he came from, what the CID was. When Billy points out that nobody could know his identity... He says he didn't get the chance to leave his name or his address with the police. Uh, the sergeant threw him out before he ever had the chance. This man in black comes up with an explanation. The man in black tells Billy that he'd been checking door locks in the local hotels when he had seen the light in the sky. He had then heard the sergeant say from a man one of the hotels had come into the station, reported UFO. He traced him down that way. It had taken the guy two weeks, eventually got there. And Billy is kind of satisfied with it initially, but later on, he does find it kind of odd. Why, why go to all the trouble to track down somebody who's really not making a ruckus about it, right? 
And and why wouldn't why would a special investigator with the CID why would they be around the hotel late at night checking locks? Billy Doyle was flummoxed. It was so odd. It was so very, very strange. I did get this tale from from the book, The Truth Behind Men in Black from Jenny Randall's. I will be sure to leave a link to the book on the Strange Pathways Facebook page. There is a free copy of it on archive.org. Absolutely incredible read. Cannot wait to get through more of this. Our final tale comes to us from the wonderful thinkaboutitdocs.com. This is June 1997. Finnish Bay, St. Petersburg region of Russia. There's a, there's a submariner, Nikolay M. Now, he was an amateur diver. He was, he was in the shallow water in the Finnish Bay. And he, he spots a strange elongated object. It, it almost looks like a cucumber. Now, he's, he's essentially doing a scavenging, uh, service he's he's bringing up old metal he's getting parts of old ships he's he's reclaiming stuff that's just just going to be laying at the bottom of a, of, of a body of water now nicolay he's thinking that this is part of the wreckage of an old vehicle a boat some sort of sailing vessel so he ties a rope around it and tries to pull it to the surface try as Nicolay might. He's not successful. He, he comes back up, grabs a couple of slings, something a little bit sturdier than rope, and he attaches it to this metal cucumber. And then he connects this to his automobile bumper. He's going to get this thing out of the bay. Now, to get this sling on, Nikolay is going to have to drill into this. So he gets to the surface, he gets all the equipment, and he brings the drill so that he can attach the slings. He, he goes to the bottom, he gets to this giant metal cucumber, drills into it, and suddenly... This stream of dark liquid, it looks like oil. It spews out of this object and hits him in the face. Instead of switching off this pneumatic drill, Nikolay decides to increase the air pressure, trying to make the hole deeper. And that's when he hears this, this loud crunch. And he sees blood in the water. Might be blood. The cucumber splits in half. And there's a large cavity inside. And this dull bubble floats out. And then Nikolay sees it. It was human-like. Unnaturally white skin. And it's got a wound on its back caused by the drill it's bleeding this creature's face is is twisted in anger and pain rage and it sees nikolay it locks eyes with nikolay its mouth is opening and closing but no sound is coming out Nikolay, he's terrified. He tries, he tries to push this cucumber object and the entity away. But this creature grabs his hand. It has clawed fingers. It tore into his sleeve. It cuts into Nikolay's arm. Nikolay is struggling. He's got the drill in his free hand. And he stabs this 
thing into the chest. Nikolay lost consciousness. He's pulled out of the water. But the damage to his hand is severe. He loses part of his hand. No traces of the metal object, the cucumber. No traces of the humanoid were ever found. Thank you for joining us here again on Strange Pathways. Please head on over to YouTube, comment, like, subscribe. We're on a lot of podcast aggregators, Spotify, iTunes. Uh, We would really appreciate a positive review on any of those. If you could get the word out, tell your friends, tell your family, you know you have that one friend or maybe multiple friends They would absolutely love Strange Pathways. Get the word out. Let them know. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. If you'd like a little bit more throughout the week, go on over to our Instagram or our TikTok. Links will be down below in the description. Take care of yourselves and each other. 